Well, good morning. How's everybody doing? Yeah, that's awesome. Amen. That was horrible, actually. That was not good. It's not good. I love you enough to tell you how bad that was, right? This side of the room killed it. Y'all, you kind of met it. How's everybody doing this morning? Amen. It's like good energy. That's great. Welcome to week 500 of the Philippians. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. We're uh, going through the book of Philippians, partners in the gospel, and i uh, just really been digging in, and I've had an opportunity to preach a couple different weeks, and just the depth that this book has, and the depth that the Bible has in general, how connected it is. Like, you can read one verse here, and there are other verses that support. It's just amazing to me to go through this book, and I'm excited and humbled to share today. Um, I, I wanted to do a quick plug for the fall festival. It's coming up the end of this month. It's on a Sunday, the 30th, so two weeks from today. And I want to encourage you all to come to that. I have a buddy who gave me ghost peppers. So I'm going to make brisket ghost pepper chili. So you just think about that. If, if, if that that's right, it's two of you. I like that. But anyways, I thought it was exciting. And so if you come, you can have a cup of that, I guess. But uh, I want to encourage you to come to that. And so as we are at the end of chapter 3 here, and so chapter 3, is that the static you're talking about? Yeah, it's going to come back. Hold on for one second. And the joke you tell after that is there's the demons and the sound equipment sure got, oh, got us this morning, didn't they? No. So we're in chapter three here, and um, <clears throat> we're going through the book of Philippians, and we've talked about a lot of things in chapter three. We started off with rejoicing in the Lord and just really understanding what re rejoicing is. And then we went into uh, legalist, right? So Paul warns against being legalist, where you're trusting in your efforts, you're trusting in what you've done, and he calls legalist dogs, right? And so, and then, so legalists, they don't feel like they need grace, right? Because we're good enough, we can do enough things, we can reach perfection and salvation, and that's kind of the idea of legalism, is that I'm going to work so hard, I don't need grace, then on the other side of that, Paul talks about people who are enemies of the cross, those who abuse grace, those who follow their stomach, follow desires. And if you live in our culture for any amount of time, you know <clears throat> that that's everywhere. We're always following what we want to do, how we want to do it, what, what, us makes, what makes us feel good. I can't tell you the number of times in the last few months I've heard, man, if it feels good, just do it. If it makes you happy, what? Do it right? That's what the culture says, right? And so when Paul's talking about people who handle salvation in that way, they abuse grace. They know Jesus, but I can live however I want to live, and I don't have to worry about following after Jesus. And that's an abuse of grace. He calls them enemies of the cross. And so kind of two different sides there. And so then we come to our passage for today, which is Philippians 3, 20 through 21. And Paul says, our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform, our, transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. So... Last year, actually almost exactly last year, I had the opportunity to go to Honduras. And so there is a ministry down there called Excel Global Outreach, and they help uh, people in the villages of Honduras. They do dental br brigades, they do some medical stuff. I, I was able to share the gospel personally with 250 people many of them accepting the gospel. They're just hungry for love. They're hungry for knowing Jesus. They also need medical, and there's so much going on there. It was a great experience, but I got to thinking about that. I got on the plane to go to Honduras last year, and it was cool, right? Kind of the weather that we're having right now, kind of like sweatshirts maybe. You know, it was nice, like 70, 75. Got on the plane, watched a two-and-a-half-hour movie, ate a an airport, airplane, snack, whatever those are, and then got off the plane. Immediately when I got off the plane, I noticed I was not in Atlanta anymore, right? It was hot. I immediately began to sweat. I regretted the jacket that I had. I had to take, take it off. And so it was hot. All the signs were not in English anymore. They were in Spanish. 
So basically, I didn't know where to go. It's like I couldn't read it, but I could see like little icons. So I would like follow the little icons in and just hope that the people I'm following know where they're going, right? People are talking in Spanish. People are coming up to me, asking me questions. And I'm just like, ah, yeah, okay, that's great. Uh, good. I mean, bueno. I don't know. Right? I was out of place in this moment, right? And so I'm walking down. I'm sweating. And I get to customs. And so customs, when you go into a country that's not your country, they ask you why you're there, right? What's your business here? What are you doing here? What are you bringing into this country? What are you doing? So they started asking me these questions, and I'm like, well, I'm here to help with a dental and a missionary thing, and where are you staying at? I'm staying in this general area. I don't know the address. And he's like, well, who's picking you up? Well, this person is picking me up. Well, are they a citizen? Well, I don't know, maybe. <laughs> you know, it's like, so they're like asking me all these questions that are important because I'm going into a foreign land and they want to know why I'm going into that foreign land. And I immediately know when I am in that country that my citizenship is elsewhere. I immediately know that. Nobody has to tell me that, okay, I'm not a citizen of Honduras. I feel it. I know it. And when Paul's talking here, that's kind of the idea that he's saying. He's saying our citizenship is in heaven. And he says, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. So he's talking to the people of Philippi. And they would have immediately understood the analogy of citizenship because they were Roman citizens, but they lived in Greece, right? And so there was a lot of really good things and privileges to being a Roman citizen, right? So they loved that citizenship. So what they did, they looked Roman. They dressed Roman. They thought Roman. They had pride in being Roman. They enjoyed the privileges, but they also had responsibilities of being Roman in this foreign land. So they understood that analogy. And Paul's saying, we have a Christian, a Christian citizenship wherever we are. That our citizenship is in heaven. The Christian lives as a foreigner in this world. I'll say that again because it doesn't feel like that all the time. But the Christian, literally, you have Jesus living inside of you. We live as a foreigner to the culture, as a foreigner to the world. Our citizenship is in a kingdom somewhere else. So we can fall back on being citizens of heaven. We can trust in some, some things like his grace holds us. We don't have to make his grace be strong, man. His grace is strong and it will cover you. His mercy chose us. When he looked at you, he said, you know what? You're not gonna get hell and damnation. I'm gonna give my son as a sacrifice and you get to accept that his mercy chose you. His love has saved us. The reason he went through everything that he went through and this whole glorious humanity that, that we deal with is because of his great love for you. Like the team was just singing, man, how he loves us. And that song, <clears throat> I've been singing that song for like 15 years, right? It's one of those God songs that will just keep going on and on. Like maybe you don't sing it for two years, but as soon as you hear it again, the truth, the simple truth that he loves us, it, it pierces into the soul. It speaks to something in every single person that he loves us and he went through what he did for us. We are his portion. He's the prize. His sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross made the way, right? Right? And so that's something that as a citizen of heaven, our way has been made because of the sacrifice of Jesus. The Bible says we are his and he is ours, right? It's like a loving re relationship. Over and over in the New Testament, it says we're in Christ and Christ is in us, right? We have the mind of Christ. We have the heart of Christ. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. We can trust and move. And even in a little bit, we'll see about a glorious body so what happens when we live as foreigners to heaven? You know, that's kind of, I always, my brain kind of works that way. I always work backwards and work my way up. It's like, yeah, we're citizens of heaven and there's so much going on there. But what happens to the believer when we live as foreigners to heaven? Well, one thing is conviction. 
And I thought about how, how to say this so that it makes sense, but I want to encourage you. If, if we can sin and ignore Jesus and ignore the Holy Spirit over and over again and never feel that conviction, man, check yourself, right? Because the Holy Spirit is real. And me personally, there's times in my life that I can, excuse me, that I can go through the motions for a while. I can give in to temptation or I can give in to angry thoughts or I can be rude to people or I can do whatever the temptation is in your life. I can do these things for a a time and not feel anything. But eventually, the Holy Spirit comes in and goes, I didn't, I didn't call you to do that. I didn't save you to not care about people. I didn't give my life so that you can just live however you want and be like that enemy of the cross and just live however I want. No, no, no. This sacrifice meant something so it's conviction, man. I come in and I'm like, okay, Jesus, oh, I'm so sorry. What do I do? And he's like, I need you to just sit in this conviction for a second. We don't get to just run past this feeling, right? Feel it. Be in it. Know that it matters. Another thing that happens when we live as foreigners to heaven is that challenge and accountability from safe people, right? So we've got people in our lives, hopefully, that um, are challenging us or inspiring us, however you wanna say it, like they're beside us growing towards the Lord. And there's times in our lives when we are making our own choices and our own decisions, we can be open to listening to people who love us and to people who have our best interests in heart and people who are also praying and hoping that we grow in our faith, right? Or we cannot, we can choose to not listen to those people. But one of the things that happens is we get conviction, but also the people in our lives that love us, that are spirit filled, but believers can see what's going on in our life and they come to our aid, they help us. They also challenge us at times like to, to get off the seats, right? Serve the Lord or to quit doing this or to let go of this or to hold on to that. Like those people come into our lives for a season and for a very real reason when we're living the way that we want to live. When we, um, I don't exactly know how to say this. So I'm just jumping into it. Our identity is wounded. So here's the thing. What I was talking about earlier, grace and mercy and love and the Holy Spirit coming to live inside of us. As a believer, we have a purpose. I don't think you know how important that is in a person's life. When, when someone loses their purpose, they, a lot of times they lose hope for life, right? And so as a believer, we have purpose that's given to us innately by the creator of the universe that loves you. And so when we're living however we want to live, we're literally living outside of the purpose of what God gave us. And what that does is it wounds us. It wounds our identity. It wounds who we are. And then so when we think we do something bad, we think, oh, I'm a piece of crap. No, you're not. You're not a piece of crap, right? But Jesus is there to say, okay, come back. You've got Christian people that are there to say, come back. You've got the Holy Spirit that is convicting and saying, come back. And instead of listening to that, we let our identity say, we're nothing. But no, no, no. You're worth so much to the Lord that he sacrificed his life, right? And so he sacrificed himself for you you for me and that's how important you are and so when we get into that mindset and we start messing with our identity man we miss the true purpose and the true reason for who Jesus is the Christian life takes surrender to Jesus amen the Christian life takes surrender to Jesus I've been doing this you version on centering myself on Jesus him being the center of my life I got this question the other day. Man, why is it so hard to make Jesus the center of my life? Why is it so hard? And man, this popped in my head because we don't live here. 
That's why it's hard. We live in a foreign land that pushes us. Our culture pushes us in certain areas. We don't live here. That's why it's hard. Amen? It's like we try to center ourselves and something happens. The car breaks down. We ain't got no money. Serious. You lose a job. You lose a friendship. Family comes in and they're not the healthiest. All these things happen to try to just throw us off of just making Jesus the center of our daily life. And I can't help but think some of us are just like I was in that airport. We're just walking behind the person in front of us, hoping that we're going in the right direction. Man, I hope this, I hope this is right. And Jesus says, your citizenship is in heaven. I can direct you. And Paul is talking to these Philippians here. He says, we eagerly wait. He says, our, citizen, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly wait for a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And eagerly wait, I tried to figure out exactly what that word meant because it's like, it's like a, a root, a key word of this phrase. And we eagerly wait. It's like we look for, we give full attention, perseverance. Our desire is focused on that. It's a very hopeful passage. I got a save the date card the other day from a couple of this getting married in May of next year, right? They're so excited about getting married next year. They're already telling me, okay, this is the date, right? And so they're excited about it. They're eager to get married. They're eager to start their life. They've got all these plans. And so they're saying, hey, this is coming up. It's that kind of waiting for Jesus here. It's that eager. It's the kind of waiting where new parents, you're waiting on your first child, eager, waiting, right? Where you're sitting there, you've got the nursery done, you've got all these hopes and dreams of what would happen to, for, for the kid, for the girl, for the boy. Man, it's so exciting. It's that kind of eagerly waiting you got a new job, right? Got a new job, you're looking forward to it, and you're about to get paid double, amen? It's that kind of waiting. You're waiting on that first paycheck. It's, it's eager, it's exciting, it's waiting from a full position of being a full citizen, from the position of being a full citizen of heaven. You are totally accepted. You are part of the kingdom of God. That is where your citizenship is. When we get there, you'll be able to tell the difference, right? It's like, wow, that really is a different feeling to know that I'm home. When I flew back from Honduras and I got into the Atlanta airport, I knew I was home. Paul names the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, we wait for a savior from there. We wait for a savior from this eager waiting. We are in a foreign land, but we're waiting on the Savior eagerly with eyes open. We will be transformed. So Paul continues and he says, the Lord Jesus Christ, he will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body. The body is weak. The actual word here that Paul used was like body of humiliation. It's that kind of a humble condition that we live in. The body is weak. We know it, right? You can feel it. If you've ever given in to temptation that you didn't want to give in to, you felt how weak you were in certain situations. I, I've always had this thought for the longest. I don't blame anybody for anything because a few short decisions away in, and I'm in that same spot. And so that is how sin works. That's how temptation works. But it's like the body, this vessel that we're in, the world and how it works is weak, is humble. It brings us down to a point of humiliation is what Paul was saying. And Jesus can transform that. Jesus can change that. When Jesus was resurrected, he was resurrected with a new body. There's like one passage after his resurrection where all the doors are locked. He's able to get in the room. I'm not saying you're going to be able to walk through walls or anything like that. I mean, but in, in that case, man, Jesus did. 
And it's that kind of a resurrected body that Paul is talking about. It points to the power of the resurrection. There's this idea, and, and David's talked about this over and over again. It's come up in here in this series. It's the idea of he will change us. He is changing us, and he has changed us. And so he has changed us. Talking about his resurrection power, he has changed us. When we're sitting up here and somebody accepts Jesus, we had a few people last week, trusted the Lord, right? It's like when we do that, man, he changes us in that moment. The Holy Spirit miraculously and as a mystery to all of us of how it works, lives inside of us and our spirit is completely new. He has changed us. And he is changing us. So that's where the, the, the part of us, the soul, the spirit, I mean, the soul and, and the body, it's like he is changing us day by day. Something comes up, that conviction of the Holy Spirit, we surrender it to him and we're changed. And so we keep moving forward and maybe we fall back the same hole or maybe we find a new hole to fall into. But Jesus is there and we surrender to him and we're changed. It's called working out our salvation day by day. It's like those of us that have like that strong conviction that it's a daily step with him. It's a daily surrender. It's a, it's a daily thing with him, man. That's, that's, that's where it's at. And one day we will be changed. Speaking to whether we're caught up in the air or whether we die and we go to heaven. We are changed then, and there'll be a resurrected body, and there's a lot of stuff to that that I haven't studied enough to go into. But still, it's like there's a lot to it. And so it's this attitude of the resurrected power of Jesus covers all time. It really does. And so for us, we won't be perfect now. That's where we talked about legalism kind of comes in. So we won't be perfect now, but keep surrendering. Man, pride is one of the worst things. It's, probably, it's one of the worst sins. There's a lot of bad sins out there, but the root sin of pride like leads to, it springs up to 50 different things. And if we can keep the heart of humility and surrendering to Jesus, I'm not saying be controlled by people. I'm not saying listen to what everybody says. I'm saying listen to the word, listen to the spirit, surrender to him. Keep surrendering. Keep being sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And keep making the decision to, to trust. I will let you know that just because you're a believer in Christ, just because you're trusting God, doesn't mean everything's gonna work out exactly how you want it to. Keep trusting. Keep surrendering. That's something I tell myself all the time. Resurrection power. So Paul says, he will transform the body of our humble condition to the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Jesus can subdue all things, right? He has that power by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Man, there's miracles. Jesus has the power to change a body, right? He has the power to heal, right? And so I feel like out of the three things I'm about to talk about, a lot of us say, man, if I've never seen Jesus actually heal somebody, I want to see an arm grow back. I want to see someone get healed of this or healed of that or healed of this. And I'm like, hey, I get it. That's miraculous when that happens. But how miraculous is it when he, when he heals a mind? Man, I'm in counseling right now and there are so many disorders and personality things and 
things that hurt people, right, daily that they struggle with from depression to anxiety to, man, it's a lot of different things that can afflict the mind. How amazing is it when Jesus heals that and changes us and turns us around, man? And I know you've seen that. You've seen somebody come in and they were broken and their life was broken and they had no hope and they found Jesus. And what do they get? Purpose and a hope. That's a miracle. How about when Jesus changes a heart, right? The emotional side of it, like, your heart is completely hardened towards someone. Your heart is completely hardened towards God in general. You see somebody who was totally far from the Lord. And then three years later, you meet up with them and they tell you their story of how God shattered that black, cold heart they had and just made it warm and to care about people. I've seen that. And it's a miracle to watch. That's power. That's resurrection power. And you think in your own life, when you trusted the Lord, that was a miracle that Jesus did for you. It's no small thing. Even if you got saved, like my kids got saved early, like five, seven. I was like, y'all sure you understand? And they were like, yeah. And I said, well, I'm gonna make you wait because I don't know you. I don't think you do. And they did. And it's a miracle and Jesus has done that for every person in the world. And all we have to do is reach out and accept that. The power, the resurrection power that we're talking about was displayed as he overcame sin, death, and was resurrected. It is the most pivotal moment in history, in all of time. When Jesus, when God died and separated himself from the Trinity and died for you. His blood covered the sin of all time, right? That's a miracle. It's power. And he's giving that down sacrificially and through his grace and just giving of himself. But on the third day rose again and brought power and brought strength and gives it. That's the way that we can actually be with him. He didn't stay dead. Amen. It's a miracle, the resurrection. It's a miracle, the power. And Paul's sitting here going, guess what? I'm going to transform you in your lowly condition by this resurrection power. It's amazing. It's amazing. He says, stand firm. Philippians 4.1. Let's all celebrate. We made it to the last chapter. <laughs> woo, 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 woo. I expected that clap to be a little stronger. Whatever, it's fine. So then, dearly loved and longed for brothers and sisters, my joy, my crown, in this manner, stand firm in the Lord. This is a part of this passage. He says, man, in this manner, because of the power, the resurrection power of Jesus, stand firm in the Lord, dear friends. Stand firm in our citizenship. Stand firm as we eagerly wait for Jesus. Stand firm in his resurrection power. A amen? Man, joy and crown and in this manner, stand firm. And we're sitting here looking at Paul talking to this Philippian church. And I'm actually going to get you guys to stand with me. You guys stand with me. We're talking about standing firm and who he is and what he's done. We're going to respond in a little bit different way today. We're going to celebrate the resurrection power that lives inside of us. Amen? That's right. I need a little more than that because we're about to celebrate. So we're going to celebrate who Jesus is. Amen? We're going to take communion. You can do that if you want. You can come down and have prayer from our faith coaches. But whatever you do, don't miss the opportunity to trust in who he is and what he's done, right? Trust in him because he's good. Trust in him because he is worthy. And as we continue, as we sing, let's give it to him. Amen? Like there's nothing in this world that's better than Jesus. And we can stand firm in his truth and what he's done. Amen? And so as we sing this, as the team comes up, y'all come on up. Let's sing to the Lord because he's good about the resurrection.